Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, He promises. Believe Him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace and the things of earth will grow strangely I think I'm going to begin by reading a few verses from Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And uh, I think maybe I have written down or printed in the bulletin 11. Begin back with, with uh, verse 9, Psalm 103, 9, reading from the NIV. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I, uh, I mentioned, I think, that the, well, the Bible says, and I mentioned last Sunday, the passage that says, small is the gate and narrow the way that leadeth to life. And I asked you last Sunday to visualize the road we travel as a narrow ridge with a sheer drop-off on either side, and we talked about that a little bit. Uh, and that's not my subject, but I will build a bit on last Sunday's message. So you might go away saying, well, the pastor's still on, a little bit on the negative. I usually am not, I hope, but still, it's the gospel message, so... <laughs> On our marathon, uh, my, many of you know our marathon, our Goodwill Tour North, that took us away for three weeks, 
uh, consisted of funerals and visiting the sick in the hospital, and I officiated a wedding at Cloudland Canyon State Park in Georgia. That's near the Tennessee border and uh, in the mountains uh, around Chattanooga. And, uh, of course, the wedding was planned a long time ahead, but unlike uh, un the other events, the, the funerals and all of these things that suddenly struck, anyway... We took a few minutes, even though we were there two nights, we only took a few minutes to actually look at the park. Took uh, Some of my grandkids, we went over and looked at the park. I mean, looked at, actually, the, the site we wanted to see was a, a gorge at one point, about 2,000 feet drop. And as I peer over the edge, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling something as I look down. Oh, I think it's called fear. Yeah. And when I, when I was 40 years old, I was asked to take the position of youth pastor in a church. I had been a youth pastor once before, and then I'd also pastored. So my response was no. First of all, I want, to, I want another lead pastor role, and I, I'm, I'm 40 years old. Don't you think I'm a little old to be a youth pastor? Well, uh, the, the, the lead pastor wasn't going to give up, so he calls me in a few, a few days or weeks, and he says, have you uh, ruled that out completely? And I thought, well, I thought I had. <laughs> well, he talked to me and talked to me, and we prayed about it, and, and so... Ultimately, I did accept the position of youth minister again when I was 40 and the minister of outreach. He wanted me to be a minister of music as well, and I said, I don't think I can conduct a choir. I don't think that's, that's quite uh, anything that I can do. Well, you know, youth pastors have benefits. I can remember walking around Kings Island, which is in Cincinnati, Ohio, eating hot dogs on the church's money. This isn't a bad gig, you know? Uh, not so bad. All the teens are out. I don't even have, you know, they're supposed to meet me at a certain time. They have over a, a hundred rides at Kings Island. One or more are roller coasters. I don't ride roller coasters. I don't know about you. I don't. But I'm a youth pastor, and the teens, one in particular, are inviting me to ride the, the roller coaster. No, the thing scares me. I don't like it. I, I like to have fun. I like to get on fun rides. I didn't say that, by the way. No, no, uh, I politely decline, but of course that doesn't work. Uh, inviting, daring, challenging me to ride the roller coaster. Declining doesn't work. All right, all right, all right, all right, okay. And you know the routine. It slowly goes tick clank, tick tick clank, tick tick clank, tick tick clank. And pretty soon I can see 14 states from where I'm at, and it doesn't make me feel good at all, you know? Um, and then you know what happened? The brakes went out completely. And down, I'm, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm my life flashes before me, and uh, I grit my teeth, and this is, the, this is the day of the accident, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and uh, I look back, and that kid that taunted me, and he has got his arms in the air, and he's laughing, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I can't wait to get this over with, and he's got this big stupid smile on his face. I can still see him. I didn't let him see me sweat, but uh, they could have guessed it. In fact, I survived, and I think I rode the roller coaster one more time in my life. It was with my small children. It was called the Scooby-Doo roller coaster. So you can imagine how serious and big a deal it was. So sometimes I also have a fear, an unreasonable fear called claustrophobia. And sometimes when I visit prisons and jails, I find myself in a position to be just a little fearful. I know it's nonsense. I know it's a phobia, but it's still there. As we think about fear... What does it mean when the Bible tells us to fear God? Is it like riding the roller coaster? Is it, is it a phobia kind of fear? I believe that the fear of God primarily, and you've heard me preach this message, not this message, but one before, where I talked about fearing God as talking about in, we're in awe of God, we reverence God, uh, we respect God, we have deep respect for Him, and that's the kind of fear it's talking about. But I want to be very careful about leaving the fear of God in the awe and the reverence and the respect column, okay? Let's look at some of the Bible characters to see if any of them experienced real fear. As we begin to read the Bible, on page two in my Bible, and it's probably in chapter two as well, uh, we run into a guy named Adam. Some of you have heard about Adam. Adam's the first human being to encounter God, and Adam says, at some point, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. I was afraid. We flip over a few pages and we meet a man named Moses, one of the greatest men of the Bible. And Moses sees this bush and it's on fire and it's burning and it's burning and it's burning, but it's, it's still there. It isn't consumed. Hmm. 
Then he begins to hear something. The voice of God coming out of this bush, what happened? Did Moses say, hey, this is pretty cool? No, Moses fell on his face. He hid his face. Why? He, is, he was afraid, fear. Let's go a little bit further. The people gather at Mount Sinai, and the Bible says God comes down, and the mountain is covered with smoke, and the ground is rumbling under the feet of the people, and God's voice is so awesome that they cry out to Moses, don't let God keep talking to us. We're going to die. They were so frightened. What's the problem? Fear. And then when we get to Job, he makes it quite clear, I am terrified at the presence of God, and I am in dread of him. What about Isaiah? He prays in the temple, and as he prays, he has a vision of God in his glory. And most of you remember that passage in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah's response was affliction, grief, fear, trouble, misfortune, all in this word, woe. He says, woe to me, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, having to do with how he talks and what he says, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What's going on? Deep fear. I'm as good as dead. I can't look at God and live. That's what the Bible has said in the past. All right, Pastor, uh, you're right. Some did experience fear. Uh, and they were good and righteous people, yes. Now, I mentioned Isaiah, he prophesies under the influence of the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 8.13, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Well, yeah, but that's Old Testament. Yeah. Well, the Old Testament, God would, uh, you still see and, and, and sense the grace of God even in the Old Testament. Uh, and then you'll say to me, well, the New Testament's all about grace. That's true. Jesus is full of grace. Now listen to the words of Jesus. Luke 12, 4. I, this is Jesus. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who killed the body and after that can do no more, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So when we study the word fear in Scripture, it certainly means reverence. It certainly means awe. It certainly means respect. But I believe it goes beyond that just a little bit. A.W. Tozer was a well-known pastor associated with the CMA Church and very, very much quoted, very often quoted. I would consider him very conservative, both theologically and in real issues, maybe a little more so than I am, but very well respected. And I quote what he says. He says, in the old days, people of faith were said to walk in the fear of God and to serve the Lord with fear. However intimate their communion with God, however bold their prayers, at the base of their religious life was the conception of God as awesome and dreadful. Wherever God appeared to people in Bible times, the results were the same. An overwhelming sense of terror and dismay, a wrenching sensation of sinfulness and guilt. And if you remember... Uh, over and over again, when the disciples saw the miracles, you know, just catching all the fish that night and people being raised from the dead, they didn't say, well, he's a jolly good fellow. They were frightened because they'd never seen anything like it. So, um, well, we've come a long way. We've outgrown that primitive idea. And Tozer recognizes that. And here's his response. The self-assurance of modern Christians, the basic levity present in so many of our religious gatherings, the shocking disrespect shown for the person of God are evidence enough of deep blindness of heart. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, but this healing fear is today hardly found among Christian people. End of quote. The, the biblical fear of God might be similar to the fear I felt at Cloudland Canyon in a place where there is realistic danger, okay? People who act foolishly and go near the edge sometimes die. And yet it is such a place of beauty and it's such a place of grandeur. The fear of God is not fear that drives you away. The fear of God is the kind of fear that draws you in and it beckons you. It might not feel comfortable to think of God as scary, but as I shared last Sunday, the Bible pictures Jesus as both the lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
Why does Scripture tell us to fear God? I mean, why would that even be a good thing? As we look at the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, there was thundering, and there was lightning, and the people panicked. What did Moses say to the people? Now listen, verse 20. Don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Now let's, let's think about that just for a moment. There's something inside of us, or maybe I'm the only one, but I'm going to guess that there's something inside of us that will always push the limit, okay? Get away with much, as much as we can. And if your job requires that you be at work at 9 a.m., but you always come in at 9.30, and you're never penalized, you will always come in at 9.30. Or you might try waiting until 9.45 or 10, knowing how we are. But if you fear you might get a pay cut or be terminated, you will arrive on time. I'll tell you an interesting story. Need a little levity here. When I was 18 or 19 years old, I drove with friends to Fort Recovery, Ohio. That was about five or 10 miles from my home, which was in Indiana. And we went to drink, not Pepsi or Coke, but we went to drink uh, because uh, you, could, you could drink at age 18 there, but you were 21 in, in Indiana. I'm gonna leave out a lot of interesting details that <laughs> you might imagine. <laughs> But on my return to Indiana, my friends went their separate ways, and I picked up my friend named Mike, and as I was driving, I was pulled over by the city police officer for having uh, a loud muffler. I, I probably had put glass packs on my GTO that, that I was driving, but I think I also had a hole in my muffler when it made it especially loud. And uh, so uh, he pulled me over, and uh, he asked if I had been drinking. I, had to, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't even never even close to being a Christ follower in those days. And so I debated, am I going to tell the truth or am I going to lie? What shall I do? What shall I do? Hmm. Well, I better tell the truth. So I said, uh, yeah, I've been drinking. And he said, uh, his response was, I'm, I'm glad you, you didn't lie to me because you smell like a brewery. That was actually how he responded. And then he said, has your friend been drinking? Mike, my, my friend that I had picked up but didn't go with us over there, has he been drinking? I either said no or I had said I don't know. But he had been at his girlfriend's house. Well, ask him to come up. I want to smell his breath. Hmm, okay. So I received my ticket. The, the, the officer was very nice. Uh, I received a ticket for a muffler violation. My friend Mike sitting in the back seat of the car in fear. Now, what was he afraid of? The police? I don't think so. A fine? I don't think so. Jail? Not particularly. No, it was something else. And suddenly, out of the clear blue, Mike said, a dumb thing, I thought, to the officer. Do you still want to smell my breath? I thought that was kind of weird. And the officer said yes, and got him, you know, in his face, and gave me the ticket, and I and told us to go straight home, and I did. I drove out of that parking area feeling really good. I got off good. No, I didn't get to go to jail. I drove a few hundred yards, and Mike said. You know those ashtrays by the armrest in the back seat of the police car? Yeah, and oh boy, I thought, oh man, we just got off scot-free almost, and he's done some terrible damage and maybe put ashes all over. The I could just was trying to imagine what he might have done. And uh, much to my surprise, he said, uh, I ate those ashes. You have to think about why he ate those ashes. He wanted to coat his mouth so that the police officer wouldn't smell the alcohol. Now, why did he do that? We had a lot of fun with that over the years. My friend Mike passed away recently, but we had a lot of fun with that. The Bible even talks about eating ashes so we could actually go to the Bible. And uh, why did he do that? Fear. But fear of what? His dad. If I go to jail for drinking or if perhaps if dad finds out I've been drinking, he'll kill me. He'll kill me. If Mike had known the position he would be in that night, he wouldn't have come close to breaking the law or breaking dad's law. Fear would have kept him legal, and fear would have kept him safe. The Bible sees the fear of God in that same way. It is a healthy, restraining fear and force in your life. In the New King James Version, in the Psalmist 103, 17 says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. 
The NIV says the Lord's love is with those who fear him. I don't like that one quite as well because the Lord's love is with everyone. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And then it completes that, verse by, or that passage by saying, on those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments and do them. Fear God and do his commandments. People who fear God will do what he says. Now, I know I shouldn't be involved in this, and I'm, I'm sure it isn't right. Uh, it's sin, but I know God will forgive me. It'll be okay. He's a God of grace. That's a very selfish and dangerous way to serve the Creator. But I was baptized a believer, and, and I can depend on grace. Let me give you a little brief. Boy, I, I, I feel like when I do this, there's so much more that needs to be said so you truly understand. But let me give you a brief lesson in doctrine. Very brief. I haven't done this ever in the pulpit in this church. Calvinists believe election is unconditional. Arminians believe election is conditional. We are Arminians. Methodists and most churches are Arminians. We are Wesleyan Arminian. A five-point Calvinist believe that the elect, the Christians, are chosen by God. God made a decision to choose you but not you. Doesn't matter what you do, you can't go to heaven because you're not chosen. But you, God chose. That's a, that's a five-point Calvinist. God made the decision to choose you and not you. You, sir, have no choice in the matter. And a lot of people go to churches that believe that, and they have no idea what they believe. But that's, that's doctrine. The second, Arminians believe, we Arminians, God elects those who choose him of their own free will. We have free will. And like I said, that's Methodist and most denominations, but not all. Now there's a halfway Calvinist called, that talks about eternal security. Once I'm saved, I'm always saved. You're forgiven for all your sins, past, present, and future, no matter what those future sins are. So if you commit the most heinous crime imaginable, you're still part of the family and you're going to heaven. Doesn't matter how bad the sin is. Doesn't matter how many people you kill, how many people you murder, you're still going to go to heaven. Now I realize there's a lot of argument that goes back and forth. I've I've been involved in that all my life. So, so you're not going to tell me anything. Oh, yes, but pastor, you don't understand. I understand. I actually have Baptist training. I'm, I'm trained Baptist as well as some other uh, background, so I know what I'm talking about. So, eternal security is a logical consequence of a five-point Calvinist, those who have no choice. Now, there are verses in support of unconditional eternal security. You can go to the Bible and find it, I promise you. Ah, but there are also verses in support of election and predestination. Oh, but you know what? There's also verses that support free will. Wow, what are you going to do? Why are you saying this, Pastor? You barely touched on it. Okay, that's true. I believe the God... Now, this is what I believe. So that's why you've never heard me talk about it. I've preached in churches where there were Calvinists. I've preached in churches where there are many. I've preached in all those churches, I believe. I believe the gospel message to the church is to the church and to the world, and it's, it's just about three things. Jesus Christ crucified, dead, buried, and raised again. And then after that, the gift of salvation for all people, and finally, the making of disciples. That's all it's about. The only time you will ever hear most churches arguing about these things that I told you is in Sunday school class. People love to, I don't, I'm not talking about your Sunday school class, but Sunday school classes, we run into it more than once over the years. But I am troubled when I hear, even in this church, free will com, uh, comments that just sort of assume, I'm a Christian, so I don't have to worry about, you know, whatever. They may not say it, but they infer it. And when I look at the Bible, which tells us over and over to fear God, well, Why? Why would I fear God? I mean, if there's no penalty. So this is where I stand. You may all leave the church when you find out where I stand, but this is where I stand. I believe that the doctrine of eternal security has a lot of merit, and I believe it covers a lot. But I also believe that a person who once walked with God can denounce God by word or by deed. He can curse God, and he can walk away and become apostate, and he will not go to heaven. Now, I know that doesn't fit any of you, because we all know that we all sin. I, I believe my theory or my doctrine says you don't have to sin. But we all do anyway. 
In other words, we don't, now, now I realize, again, that, that depends on the definition of sin. Some people, you know, believe if you make a mistake, that's a sin. But I'm talking about a willful transgression. I don't have to sin. Sadly, we all do. Okay? So, so not, none of you fit into that apostate, but I do believe that, for whatever it's worth. Most of us would agree that a healthy fear of God might keep us from sinning. If nothing else, as a Christian follower of Christ, when I sin willfully, it, even if I'm going on to heaven, God is not pleased. He's not blessing me and he's not using me to his glory. He can't. I'm getting excited, right? I'll, I'll calm, okay? Okay. Most of us would agree that a healthy fear of God might keep us from sinning, might keep us from being unkind to people, others, or from actually ruining our own lives. Why would I want him for a friend? Well, we, I think we know that. It's a fair question. And the psalmist gives us some answers. He tells me what I can expect if I draw near to God in fear and trembling. And this is also in 103. I think it's verse 3. He forgives all your sins, heals all your infirmities, redeems your life from the grave, crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. He satisfies you with good things, and your youth is renewed like the eagles. Surprised? I mean, this is not really what you expect from a God who tells you to fear. When you come before God humbly, knowing you don't really deserve any good thing, and he blesses you with benefits, even blessings, things that you didn't ask for, and over and over again, I see that in my life. I look back and I'm like, wow, God did this and God did that, and I didn't even ask for that, but it's a wonderful blessing, and, and I ain't been the, I've not been the best Christian. No, I've been one of his not-so-good guys. You know, I've had to ask God many times to forgive me. What if, what if some Sunday at 11 a.m. we do something different? Show a movie starring you. <laughs> Your life story. Oh, boy, that's some good stuff. I, I was an athlete, and I did this, and, boy, the people are going to know all about all the good things I've done, and, 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 and we're going to show everything you've ever done. Everything. Hmm. What you said about people, you know, it's amazing. There are a lot of people, uh, over the years, I don't want to scare you or frighten you, but over the years as a pastor, it's amazing what you know about people. The things they say behind your back, they think nobody knows. It's amazing what I know about people. The nice things they say and the not nice things they say. I don't know how it happens, but it happens over and over. So, what you've said about people, how you've manipulated issues, maybe at work, cheated in college, lied to your spouse. How long does the film run before you want to crawl in a hole and just kind of pull it in after? All of us would. All have sinned and fall short of the glory. We all have something we don't want anyone really to know about. Tony Campolo says, if you knew what was in my heart and mind, you wouldn't like me. Well, we could probably all say that at times in our life, but that's grace. He loves me. He forgives me. It's beyond my understanding, of course. Listen to the words of uh, Matthias, who lived in the 600s. It's a little hard to follow because it's a few years ago. But he says, let us, this is, this guy, he's, he knows how to make a long sentence too. Let us ponder this, how we who are mortal beings continually bespotted with the mud of sins have been worthy to stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords who dwells in resplendent light that none can approach, to whose honor thousands upon thousands and myriads and myriads of angels and archangels minister as they stand before him in fear and trembling, he before whom even the heavens are not pure. One sentence. Here's the second one. Even though he strikes wonder in his angels, yet he condescends to speak with weak and wretched human beings who have rendered themselves unclean by sin. You ever do anything you knew was wrong? I, you don't have to answer that. And you can't seem to forget it, but you did it, 
and you hate it, it might have been last year or it might have been 60 years ago. And yet this God who inspires fear and chooses to offer grace and mercy and forgiveness, a God who says, I will remember their sin no more. And then in one other place in Hebrews 8, a God who will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Never to be remembered again. Here we sit around feeling bad about something we did years ago. God doesn't remember it. He chooses not to remember it. This psalm continues to speak of God's mercy and his compassion. In verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I may experience fear when I'm caught off guard. I might be fearful when my assumptions no longer account for what I'm facing. I might become fearful when reality without warning is, is really uh, more or other than I expected. The fear of the Lord is an awareness of the holiness of God, of the transcendence of God, of the otherness of God. I am not the center of my existence, and I am not the sum total of what really matters. We really don't know what's next. What now? I ask that all the time. What now, Lord? Fear of the Lord is fear minus most of the scary elements. Now, I tried my best to, to, you know, there's not a lot of writing. It's not just right out there. There are not a lot of writing about fear. You can find every other word, but you don't find much about fear as far as what people have to say about it. But I'm going to close with this. This This is from the Proverbs. Just let me share some thoughts that the Proverbs have to say about fear, and then we'll go beat the Baptist to lunch, okay? What is the fear of God? The fear of God is, this is from the Bible, the fear of God is the key to knowledge and wisdom. The fear of God is the knowledge of God himself. The fear of God is respect for the power of God's word. The fear of God is to hate what God hates, which is sin, The fear of God is the key to wisdom. The fear of God is a fountain of life to avoid the snares of death. And the fear of God is hope in the Lord. Now I know for some of you that got a little heavy today, but it's biblical. My favorite word in the Bible, my favorite word in the world is still what? Grace. Thanks for the grace of God. Father, we are so thankful for your grace. We want to be mindful that you sometimes are angry with us. It's not all about love and peace. You have expectations. You love us, but you want us to represent you well, to commune with you. Again, we we, we don't understand way beyond what we're able to understand. But thank you, Father, that you love us and that you care. You don't want anyone to walk away. Thank you for amazing grace and for your loving kindness. We stand, please. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom May his wisdom work in you always to reflect the message of Christ to a needy and hungry world. Amen.